house uh, films like Maniac and Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer moving more towards the 80s with the slasher culture. We welcome in the directors of The Turnpike Killer, Brian Weaver, Evan Macrogiannis, as well as Edgar Moyer and William Macrogiannis. Um, gentlemen, Brian, we'll start first with you. You see the poster behind it. Uh, the Turnpike Killer released about a week ago, if I would have to say. Um, it's getting a lot of positive feed, a lot of positive buzz. Um, it's really, again, an homage. Maybe that's a better word than throwback to what this film is. Um, first, you, Brian, talk a little bit about where the idea came from for this film, The Turnpike Killer. Well, me and Evan, we had been friends for a long time before we did the film, and uh, one of our... Um, one of the things that made us such good friends was our love of horror films. Yeah. So we, you know, we would constantly go and watch movies, go to the movies when something good was playing, go to the conventions, and, you know, just uh, we were absorbed with horror films. So we saw that there wasn't really any films coming out that were like the films that we grew up on. Yeah. Um, like you mentioned, Maniac. Henry, you know, a lot of the stuff from like the mid 70s up until the mid 80s. Um, so we we saw this kind of absence of that and we decided that we were, you know, we wanted to be a part of it. We wanted to contribute to, you know, the horror genre and do, you know, movies that, uh, you know, we, you know, the type of movies that we grew up loving. So wow. we got together and, you know, we just started brainstorming and coming up with a lot of ideas. And, um, you know, we just, we wanted to do a film that really captured that essence, you know, because at the time, there, you know, at that time, there weren't, it was very sterile. You know, there's a lot of That's films that were coming out. Yeah. They were just very sterile. And we wanted to get back to the stuff that was really raw and gritty and the stuff that made you, you know, cringe or look away. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, you know, that's what we tried to do, and uh, hopefully we accomplished that. I was going to say, you know, you, you created a serial killer John Beast who is your prototypical. It's not your quiet guy in, in his mom's basement. It's more of that hulking serial killer. And, and folks, for you out there, you know, you look at the way things are with um, with the Turnpike Killer, and it really is, you know, parental advisory with it but it's a film again that throws back to that time and Evan for you you know putting this together brainstorming uh, add a little more insight into that on crafting John Beast and, and the idea for the Turnpike Killer. Well um, to kind of go where Brian went already um, we looked to to our influences the movies that we loved growing up and going to that time period of the 70s and early 80s uh, the movies like Last House on the Left and Henry and Maniac all those great movies, they were born out of political, yeah. social strife that was going on, especially in New York City. So really, when we knew we wanted to make a movie, we had the influences. Um, we knew that we wanted to do a movie that was more than just, you know, eye candy or shock for shock value. We lived in New York City, which, of course, has changed a lot since those glory days. Huge. But, yeah. you know, there's still pockets of uh, sleaze. You just have to find them. <laughs> and then as far as the killer was concerned, um, we looked. We, we had a friend, a mutual friend who was a Marine, and he had done several tours, two in Iraq and one in Afghanistan, and he was kind of the guy you always hear about, comes back and has the 20-yard stare. You know, he went, when he first left, he was, uh, you know, a kid from Queens, and he came back really, you know, a after each time more demented than the first time. Wow. Whether it was the violence he was exposed to or some chemicals, whatever it was. Yeah. You know, so we'd be, you know, hanging out. You know, we'd go see a horror movie or go to a convention and go to a diner afterwards. And, you know, Brian and I would be talking about movies and he'd be talking about, you know, where's the best place to dispose of bodies if one was to be a serial killer. Yeah. And uh, at the time he was stationed in Philly, so he would come home to New York on the weekend. So he always made that trip on the turnpike. So... You know, as we came up with this idea to do a slasher movie, we were, like, really influenced by the idea of this, like, apex predator instead of, like, the nerdy That's guy. A great term, apex yeah, predator. You know, I like that. Instead of, like, the nerdy guy, like, you know, like a Joel Rifkin type yeah. serial killer. And then when he always talked about the turnpike and he, he you know, apparently he studied it because he said that the crews only clean the sides of the roads, like, twice a year. So forensics would be impossible because, you know. Wow. So... 
It's so detailed. There's so much. It's, it almost sounds like something you'd see on like CSI, something to that extent. The, the really forensic and uh, the, the crime thriller type shows and films. Yeah, I mean, you know, and just those conversations we had with this guy. So, all those things went into the Turnpike Killer, and you know, the result is the movie. Wow. I and mean, what's interesting is yeah. they actually found some women not too far from where he was stationed, just off the Turnpike. That's insane. And, and so true we, crime, right so there. We wow. Would always, yeah, we would always joke around that you know he was out doing these things, and we'd come up with these different ideas on what he was doing yeah. at the time, and you know we just incorporated it into a into a film. It's it's you know you look at the way now that things are with with the community and and the desensitization of the uh, the horror fan and the movie fan and this kind of stuff you see a lot of it right in the news every single day so and, you know Edgar um, you know you playing Detective Lloyd and this when we talk about the crime drama crime thriller it really blends into the aspect of the slasher film being cast in this film you know you play an equal second lead to John Beast Talk a little bit about that being Detective Lloyd and what it was like to have to go through these kind of situations and be on the hunt. Well, for me, um, playing Detective Lloyd was was uh, very interesting uh, to have to just open yourself up to, you know, the, the actual possibility of these type of horrific acts. Yeah. You know that. You know that that happened to these different characters in the film, and that just happened in general in life, unfortunately. So um, for me, it was learning experience. Um, also, I also felt um, I was grateful for the opportunity to yeah. play the role uh, to these guys here for just casting me, <laughs> because um, you know it's it's always a humbling experience when someone believes enough in your craft to, you know, want to take a chance on you. So I'm no. grateful to these guys for that. But and it, and it, it was also a lot of fun to um, chase them around. So it was just <laughs> it was just different um, different reactions I felt uh, from you know putting the, you know my character together and actually chasing down Mr. Beast. Mr. Beast, <laughs> and he is a beast. And yeah, well, Liam, Liam, if I may say, Liam, if I may say, you're the young John Beast in the film. Towards the end, you were this. We were talking six to eight years ago. Someone was in that ballpark. You were a lot. Shorter and a lot younger, and and really it was you're you're breaking onto. Now you're a filmmaker. How has that been going back, looking at that to where you are now? Um, well, I knew since I was little that that's what I wanted to do is work in film, whether it be acting or directing. Um, and this is one of the first opportunities I had to do yeah. that, um, besides going to acting school. And uh, I was very grateful to have the opportunity. I was like, oh. I'm going to be in a movie, that's insane. <laughs> uh, I didn't expect it to be what it was, because when I was at, at that age, I couldn't, you know, think, mind couldn't handle topics like that. Yeah. So um, it was definitely an interesting thing, but uh, I, I don't think I'd be here without it, because that was my first big role that I had, and uh, I'm very grateful for it. Wow. Hey, Brian, you were going to say something yeah, real quick. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say the thing about... Um, um, Edgar or Detective Lloyd, um, when we were when we were coming up with the idea, we had kind of more of a stereotypical, um, you know, detective. You know, so kind of like a gruff Irish, yeah. older older Irish Italian type guy. You know, New mm -hmm. York City detective. And when Edgar came and auditioned, and we we just you know we saw the audition and we said you know we're gonna rework this because this, this guy's phenomenal. You know, so yeah. it was really it was cool. It, it, it changed things around a little bit working with Edgar and it was it, it came out better than we could have ever imagined yeah, they wow. linked itself more yeah. to the whole NYC feel you know definitely because it's a gritty movie and he's a gritty cop you know because he's also there's a scene where he's shaking down drug dealers and you see him pull a little shady you know grabs the grabs a blow and says I'll take care of this and wow. get, gets to mush a guy and I think <laughs> you had fun with that yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah he was great well the, the film is the turnpike killer and you know, for those out there right now, um, you can get it on Amazon.com. It's distributed with uh, Wild Eye Releasing. And a big thank you to Rob Hostchild for the poster behind us, the cover art, uh, and being able today for the gentlemen around us here. And uh, we've got more to come with it. But you can get it on there. And remember, this is a crime drama thriller as well as a very gritty slasher film. And uh, we'll come back and we'll talk more about that here on Horror Happens TV on Jefferson Highlights in just a minute.
Remember, check us out at horrorhappens.com. And thank you for watching. We'll be back. Welcome back to Horror Happens TV here on Jefferson Highlights. Uh, make sure and tune in every month for new episodes, including next month where we will have Chris Eilstein, who will be here as part of the up-and-coming Horror Happens Film Showcase, Saturday, January 10th. More about that, go to horrorhappens.com for the film lineup, information, ticket prices, and schedule coming up. Here on the show, though, today, we are here with the directors, the filmmakers, the cast of The Turnpike Killer, available on Wild Eye Releasing at wildeyereleasing.com. You can see the poster back there. It's currently out a, uh, an homage, a throwback to the films of the slasher era, as well as the gritty grindhouse of the 1970s film. We're here, Brian Weaver, Evan Macrogiannis, the filmmakers, Edgar Moyer, and Liam Macrogiannis. Edgar, we're going to jump up to you. And uh, let's continue a little bit about independent filmmaking and acting. Um, you've worked with Brian, you've worked with Evan and Liam now for a while. What has it been like in your career so far working with these gentlemen and uh, working on films like The Turnpike Killer and The Super? Well, first of all, uh, to the credit of these guys, they're really writers. So uh, the, the, the subject uh, that they chose to uh, pretty much entertain uh, everyone with has been uh, a privilege to work with. Um, just just in general, working with these guys for the simple fact that um, they're pretty cool. They're you know understandable, yet at the same time they have an objective and they pretty much go about accomplishing that objective uh, pretty well, uh, in my opinion. But dealing with indie films for me, uh, it's been a lot of fun because you know. Not that we'll have any experience with Hollywood films yet, but... <laughs> You're with, getting there, uh, though. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm trying. <laughs> but with um, any films, you get a chance to just deal with the raw essence of the the story uh, that you want to convey. You know, just the stuff you can hand without all the other glitz that could possibly, uh, I, I guess, dilute it some. Is what I'm trying to say. So for me, it's just it's just been a blast. I'm just really enjoying it all and looking forward to uh, other projects as well. Nice. And Liam, for you, we talked before about filmmaking. We talked um, about being a part of the Turnpike Killer, the Super. You've got your own film, Survive. You've got a variety of short films, including Blood Mask and Night of the Magician right now. Uh, spend a couple minutes. Tell us about what it's been like now with the filmmaking from the time of the Turnpike Killer. Thank you. I just want to say that, uh, like I said, it wouldn't be possible without these two here. Uh, they're part of the inspiration for me. But um, Survivor's my first full-length movie, which is about the zombie apocalypse. And now I'm working on my newest movie, Night of the Magician, which is a full-length about a magician who kills his volunteers during his shows. And um, I have to say, I've really learned a lot, met a lot of people uh, doing this, which I'm very grateful to meet a lot of these people, because a lot of them have become good friends of mine. And... Um, that's, that's basically it. Wow. And Brian, for you, we look at it with um, not only we've talked about distribution now, the Turnpike Killer getting out there, a lot of positive feedback reviews, uh, popularity growing with this film, but also the technical aspect. Talk a little bit about, first of all, the technical aspect of the Turnpike Killer and what it was like to be able to shoot it and give it that grindhouse gritty feel. Well, the interesting thing was, you know, Evan and I, we don't have film school backgrounds. Yeah. You know, our, our film school was watching movies, growing up watching movies. Um, so when we did The Turnpike Killer, that was, you know, we jumped in feet first and we just kind of learned as as we went along. Um, so the, the technical stuff, that it was a huge learning experience. Yeah. Um, but it, it, was, it was good and we wanted to, you know, again, capture that raw feeling and you know, a lot of times, a lot of these grindhouse films nowadays, 
it, it's just you know layers you know they just put yeah. a few scratches and that's what makes it a grindhouse film to us it's it's way more it's about emotions it's about a feeling that comes out of those films so it really i mean the technical part is more that's secondary really i mean it's more about the emotions uh, that that come through that really make a film especially something that's raw and gritty really stand out do you think that the copy of the turnpike killer with the way it's been distributed it still handles that indie sensibility still yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it seems, uh, you know, we'll see how it is with the way it's, you know, the, the way the release, it just came out. But what's interesting is that we have our second feature that we did after the the Turnpike Killer, the Super, and that movie is pretty much in, in limbo right now with the yeah. with the distribution company uh, that's, or the, the guy that owns it, and it's not, it's, it's nowhere to be found right now. So it, it, it's a little disheartening, but at the same time, it's, I find it really interesting and amazing almost that our first film that was done beforehand with less money has given us more exposure than the film that was made after is a wow. little more polished and is still sitting around waiting to be basically distributed to people and you know distributed worldwide um so it, it's pretty amazing to to see that this film finally you know seeing it you know the light of day and evan for you it, you know seeing that film now distributed hitting the convention circuit a lot you know you and liam and brian um, really out there pushing the film before distribution of the term pie killer talk a little bit of the aspect of distribution within this film now and how it's affected well the uh i think the amazing thing with the turnpike killer is that um when we made the movie it, it was made at a time where it was before the scene kind of blew up i mean the past couple of years there's so many directors and movies i mean i can't even keep up with the names and the titles and everything and when we made it it the climate there was you know fred vogel doing his thing you know yeah. guys like ryan nicholson you know, guys in Japan and Germany, but there really wasn't that really big, you know, Facebook and the conventions. There weren't that many conventions. Um, and, you know, we had a really good release with New York Car Film Productions. We did the VHS Big Box, which sold like 300 something copies, which was great. And it was promoted. But the amazing thing, and we're really happy about it, is that, you know, now it's 2014, where with Wild Eye, the film is still relevant. We have more fans than we did before. So the film has legs, which makes us very happy. Um, and, and with Wild Eye, the cool thing about it is now we're going to be able to reach people that we weren't able to reach before. Because before it was, you know, it was us going to Chiller or to Monster Mania, trying to do as much as we could online. But it's really hard to do that. If you don't have a distributor that's really pushing it and getting it out there, so Wild Eye will get the movie into retail stores, conventions, and you know possibly international as well. So um, you know it's a step that you know hopefully will take the movie to the next level. But it's it's been it's been pretty amazing. If if I may ask, and I think something that a lot of fans don't realize, Evan, is the frustration of of possibly waiting for your film to hit the major market. Uh, you guys have done other projects. You worked with your son Liam. Um, Talk a little bit about that, that frustration and that waiting period from the time the film's done to now that you see it out in the last week or so on Amazon.com, in stores. It, talk a little bit about that. Well, it's, it's a long journey, and especially now that, you know, now it's so easy for, for people to get a camera and, and a computer and edit and make a movie. And so many people are making movies, and there's so many smaller distribution companies that are picking, picking up these movies and putting them out there. But, you know, to wait for, you know, everyone wants, you know, the, the exposure, everybody wants, you know, to sign with the distributor that's going to treat the film how you want it to be treated. And, it, yeah, it could, be, it could be a wait. I mean, yeah. what we went through, as Brian alluded to, with the Super, I mean, we thought, you know, this, this, it had a lot more money put into it, better equipment, better gear, the tech stuff was high end, so... I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, you know, I thought, wow, you know, this movie, especially with all the reviews, yeah, it'll probably get picked up. Well, you know, here we are. We're still waiting. Um, and that's just part of the game, you know. Wow. that that game is absolutely insane because you think about everything that has to go through, all the hoops to jump through. So, um, gentlemen, I want to thank all of you for coming out, Brian, Evan, Liam, Edgar, thank for you. being a part of this. Congratulations you. You. on the release. Oh, my honor.
my honor as always, guys. You've known me a long time. Most of you have known me a long time. Um, and you know how much I am a fan of the indie circuit. So, gentlemen, thank you for coming out today, and the best of luck with the Turnpike Killer. Thank you. And thank you. remember that with the Turnpike Killer, you can get it on Amazon.com, you can get it in stores, and uh, it's definitely a throwback to the gritty um, stalker, slasher, crime drama style film that people love and grew up with, including myself, from the 70s and 80s. Don't forget to tune in next month for The Horror Happens TV. I love saying that Horror Happens TV. As we'll be talking about the Horror Happens Film Showcase with Chris Eilstein. And uh, he is the director of The Solus, and he will be a part of that great programming that will be here Saturday, January 10th at the Camp Jefferson Theater. Don't forget, check us out at horrorhappens.com. And again, a big thank you to DiaboliqueMagazine.com, a sponsor of Horror Happens TV, as well as the Horror Happens Radio Show, which you can hear every Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Homegrown Radio. Find us also on Twitter, at Horror Happens R Us, and we'll see you next month. And always remember, listen live if you dare in pleasant nightmares. to go up there. I can't do that. We talked about this for years. No, you talked about this for years. <laughs> What's with the cameras? We're shooting a documentary. Are you going to be showing good people or bad? Is there a difference? Why we're taping this. It doesn't make any sense. But it does. This means something to it. John, what's on these tapes? Yeah, John. What's on the tapes?